Hello, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Lynn. I am a customer service representative, and today I am joined by... Scott from Warmly Yours. How about that? <laughs> Would you look at that? So today we're talking about uh, getting your home winter ready with heating your LVT. Uh, so if you have any questions during today's webinar, please don't hesitate to ask. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions you might have. And you can do so either in the sidebar chat or at the bottom of the screen in the ask a question module. Uh, if we don't see your question right away, we'll definitely get to it by the end of the presentation. So today we're going to be going over, obviously, floor heating, specifically underneath luxury vinyl, either luxury vinyl tile or planks. Uh, so we're going to be going over an example project where they used our floor heating cable. We'll go over the installation process of that cable and that whole kind of project. And then we're also going to be going over the cost breakdown. So can you tell us, Scott, a little bit about, you know, why is LVT becoming so popular and why bother heating it? Well, it's very cost effective um, and people are liking the textures and the ease of installation. Um, the cost is a, is a big factor. Um, it's very durable, uh, resistant to scuffs and stains, waterproof sometimes. Um, they, it lasts a long, long time. And even though it's, it, it feels warmer under your foot, than tile does, it still does get chilly. If you're in a cold room at, over a cold space, your floor still will will feel chilly. So that's what we're talking about is, is keeping that floor warm. LVT is made of vinyl, so it's going to have its own um, rules about installation. And many of the rules uh, we follow here, we, now we can't follow, we don't know every rule there is for every different manufacturer, right? There, there are hundreds, thousands of flooring manufacturers. If we tried to put a list together and we said, okay, on November 1st, it's this, on November 2nd, it would be obsolete because you just can't keep track of that. So um, one of the things with that is vinyl is um, uh, more a little more delicate chemical wise than laminates are. Um, and that's why laminates and LVT is heated differently. Even though they're both floating, they are heated differently. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Awesome. So looking at the different types of floor heating that we have, uh, you want to make sure that you're picking the right type of system for uh, going underneath LVT. Uh, so you're going to want to look for a type of system that can be embedded. Uh, so that's going to be our temp zone systems, either our flex roll or our loose temp zone cable. Uh, so these are going to range in wattage from 8 to 15 watts a square foot, uh, depending on which product you use and exactly what kind of spacing you use for that cable. Uh, so you want to make sure that you are steering clear of our Environ product for this specific uh, application. Um, you know, vinyl and laminate are often considered very similar. They often are kind of even used terminology wise interchangeably. Um, but you want to make sure that if you're using something that is a vinyl, that you are putting an embeddable product underneath it. And once again, these aren't our rules. These are the rules of the manufacturer. So we are showing you a way to install it to comply with their requirements. Um, our environ role is um, a product that is never attached to anything and nothing is ever attached to it, which means you don't glue it down and you don't glue anything to it. You don't thin set it in. You don't thin set over it. Environ is simply a blanket that you lay out over the subfloor or over the, the padded subfloor, over a, a pad of some sort, and then you lay laminate over the top of it. Well, the issue with Environ is when you're doing that on top of a layer, there's wires and stuff that are sticking up. And that is, um, that's the issue when it goes from laminate to LVT. That's where we're going to see the difference. So um, that's one thing that we do want to keep an eye on. We're going to go into that a little bit more, obviously a lot more <laughs> later on in the presentation. 
Absolutely. Yeah, we'll definitely get to that. Uh, so we're obviously kind of coming into winter now. We're almost to mid-November, which is insane. Uh, so you want to be looking at how you're going to be winterizing your space. Obviously, we don't want your space to be especially cold. Uh, so putting down LVT is going to give you um, a lot of that extra warmth. Like Scott had kind of touched on earlier, um, it is a little bit warmer um, to the touch than tile tends to be. And it's often going to give you uh, a similar resilience and durability. Uh, that tile offers without, you know, that extra chill in the floor. Um, so adding floor heating, obviously, underneath that as well is going to not only make the floor just feel warmer when you touch it, um, but it's going to keep the space warmer too. It's going to very efficiently uh, transfer that radiant heat from the flooring up to the space, to the objects in that room, to you. Uh, so it's going to really make that space a lot warmer and cozier. So it's a really good way to, um, you know, add extra heat to spaces that are maybe uninsulated, like rooms above garages um, or any room that tends to just get extra cold in the winter, something like a basement that's harder to heat, um, adding that extra uh, warmth to that space is going to make it a lot more comfortable all winter. Right. So get, get, it, get it comfortable where sometimes it isn't comfortable in the wintertime. Absolutely. So looking at a cross section, um, we do love our cross sections here at Warm Layers. Can you tell us a little bit, Scott, about exactly how this installation goes, what we're looking at here? Yeah, you're going to be starting with a, a subfloor of some sort. Um, we're showing plywood and wood. If this were concrete or a concrete slab, you'd be adding a layer of insulation under the fixing strips and under the cable um, to uh, get the wire away from the concrete. It's something we talk about in a lot of other webinars that we do. We do webinars here every day, but um, when it comes to heating on a slab, we need to talk about that real quick. When you put heating wire directly on a slab, the slab is going to pull the heat down and it's not going to let the heat go up where you're really wanting it to go. So that's why if we were doing this over a slab, we would put insulation like Cerasorb over the top of that slab first then lay the cable on it because that'll make the cable heat go upwards instead of down into the slab. You're creating a thermal break. Anyway, different application, but we need to talk about it anyway. So if we're doing an installation like we show here over a wood subfloor, you can see the plywood is called out right here and that's what everything's going to be laying on top of. And then um, we know we're going to be putting uh, self leveling on it. So we are going to need to cover it with a primer. And the primer is going to be um, called out by the instructions of the self-leveling cement. The self-leveling cement bag is going to say, must be used with this blah, blah, blah primer. And what we're going to do now is before we put anything on the subfloor, we prime it. Then we put the fixing strips around the perimeter of the room. And we can see um, those here. Those go around the perimeter because that's what you string the cable back and forth in. Then we put the cable, we string it back and forth at whatever spacing we decide is um, fortuitous for us, um, three inch or four inch or whatever that happens to be. Um, then once we get the cable laid down in it, we're then every couple of feet, we're going to take this masking tape and we're going to use that every couple of feet to hold the cable down because cable is surprisingly much less dense than self-leveling. Self-leveling in itself is a very dense material. Anything that isn't as dense as that, besides me, I'm pretty dense too. But if it's not as dense as that, it's going to try to float to the top. So what we need to do is we need to hold those cables down while the self-leveling goes over the top of it. And once we get that nice flat floor, that nice flat heated subfloor, the LVT is going to sit right on top of that. So the self-leveling cement is very, very important because it helps you comply with usually one of the rules about the LVT warranty coverage. And that says when they say embedded, embedded heat is okay. Embedded means that it's in a layer of concrete or self-leveling. And there's usually another rule in that installation manual that says should be a half an inch from the heat source. Well, that's why you pour a half an inch of self-leveling because that gives you a half an inch separation from the wire as they're saying and it's also giving you the embedded as they are saying that is needed so those are a couple of the things that are covered by doing it this way covering your warranty um, coverage also a lot of times there will be a flatness requirement in the installation manual that says your floor must be 
flat to three sixteenths over 10 feet or whatever that number is. The cable in the environ is wavy and it's not completely flat. So that's why to get your flatness requirement, that's another reason why you use self-leveling cement. So you're getting three of the things covered there, flatness requirement, half inch distance from the heating wire, and what was the other one? Embedded. That's what it was. So those are the, that's why we built this, that it's complying, helping you comply with the warranty requirements of the system that you're installing. Awesome. Yeah, that's some really great information and kind of in the same vein talking about um, embedding your floor heating system. Um, so like you had said, you know, obviously anything that's going to be underneath the surface is going to show through that LVT over time. And I really like this drawing. You can see um, it's a really good illustration of exactly the difference between laminate and vinyl and why you want to use different products for each. Obviously with laminate, uh, it's a bit more rigid. You can you have a little bit more leeway of you know having something underneath it and it's not going to over time uh, mold itself to any of those imperfections whereas LVT does uh, what we call in the flooring industry drape um, so it's going to over time obviously you know show those imperfections show those bumps ridges um, anything that's any kind of you know un unlevelness if that's a word is all going to show through over time and can damage not only just your floor system and look weird and feel weird um, but it can damage your heating system as as well. So it's just something to keep in mind. That's why embedding is so important. I want to bring up something. I get a question all the time about why do we need to use self, self leveling? Why don't we use um, a product like Thinset? Well, the thing is with Thinset, um, we need to make sure that the Thinset, you're never going to be able to give it, get it completely flat. So um, because of that, you can have air pockets and when you have an air pocket between the LVT and the thin set that's kind of wavy because you're never going to get thin set. If you mix it correctly, the right thickness, you're never going to get it completely flat. So you can tell a floor, an LVT floor that's been put in over thin set because it will sound hollow in spaces where you walk. So you'll hear the air under there. That's why it's self-leveling and not thin set. I'm sorry to go back a, a slide there, but that's the reason why. Um, I've had to go out and work on a floor before that had thin set and they had to do it over again because hollow, good step, hollow, good step, hollow, good step, because it's resting on the top of every thin set peak. So that's what you want to watch out for. Awesome. Yeah, good, good call. Uh, so when you're looking at adding radiant heat, what are you looking for when you're deciding on what kind of LVT to be using? Can you kind of tell us, you know, how to help pick that out or what to be shopping around for? Yes, LVT, you want to make sure that the assembly is, has an R value of less than one. Because if you start putting something that has an R value of four over the top of it, the heat's never going to get to the room. It's going to be trapped under the floor. So the thicker the pad is, if it's got a self-attached pad to them, the thicker that pad is, the more apt it is to increase the R value. If you look, some of them have cork on the underneath side of them. The thing with cork is it's a good insulator. So there's another of layer, you're putting a layer, you, you just spent money on electric floor heat. Now you're putting a layer of insulation over the top of it, then another layer of insulation over the top of it, and there's not gonna be any heat getting through that floor into the room. So that's where you're going to be looking for an assembled, a plank assembly that has an R value of less than one. So also make sure that you check for the warranty coverage to make sure that particular um, LVT brand does cover radiant heat. If it doesn't, then move on to one that does because there's a lot of them out there. So if, you're, if your main choice is like, okay, I found this one, it's great, it, it says no radiant heat. Then, then that's a non-starter. You want to go to one that does allow that. Also, another question you want to ask is, what's the maximum temperature allowed? So can I heat it up to 84? Can I heat it up to 86? What can I heat it up to? Also, we need to find out what's the maximum temperature swing per day that it can do. Because our thermostats that you buy, our programmable thermostats, have a setback temperature, which means when no one's going to be on the floor overnight or during the day when you're away for work, it sets the temperature back to 70. And then during the night or when you're around during the weekends, it sets it to 84. 84, 70, 84, 70, that's your setback. That's 14 degrees. 
no, 80 to 70, 16 degrees or whatever. I mean. You get the idea. We're not, this is not a math webinar. <laughs> but anyway, some LVT companies will say you can have a maximum deviation of three degrees per day, which means you go from 84 to 79 or 84 to 81 or whatever that deviation is allowed. Three degrees, four degrees, no, no degrees. LVT is a perfect match for electric floor heat because electric floor heating, you can put the thermostat sensor in the floor. If you're doing hot water, you have to watch out for hot water because hot water overshoots the temperature and then undershoots. As the boiler kicks on, it's real hot and then it cools off eventually. The temperatures do the roller coaster, overshoot, undershoot, overshoot, undershoot. And you could have the span of three or four degrees very easily right there. And if it is a 10 degree roller coaster, then you've just voided your warranty. Electric floor heating lets you keep it right at that temperature. No overshooting or undershooting because it's in the thin set. I mean, it's in uh, self-leveling. So it's a nice smooth temperature and it stays right where it needs to. So ask the maximum temperature, ask, ask the maximum deviation of that temperature. How many degrees north or south of that temperature can it go per day? And those are going to be the things you want to learn uh, as, a, as an informed con consumer when you're looking to buy your system to make sure, hey, this is going to work. If there's ever trouble with it, I know I followed all the rules, right? That's the most important thing. I follow the rules, and if something happens, then it's a problem with the floor, the, the LVT itself. So that's what we're here today to do, to get this information out there. So you go in and go, I know what I need to get. I need to get this, 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 and this, and I'm good. Awesome. Yeah, it's definitely information you want to be looking for. I think a lot of people just pick their flooring type or like the color without looking into, you know, some of the logistics of it. So it's something to really keep in mind. So looking at at the project overview for what we're talking about today. Uh, so like I said, they had used a Tempstone uh, cable, a 240 volt system. Uh, so the total area um, that they were, you know, kind of the space that they were heating was 161.5 square feet. And they actually covered about 132 square feet of that with actual heating element. Uh, generally speaking, we see about 80% um, of a room on average being heated um, and then 20% not not being heated for a myriad of reasons. Usually, you know, you're not heating directly up to the wall. You're not standing right up against the wall. Um, you know, you're not going to be heating underneath low-lying furniture or uh, cabinets, things like that. So that's usually why you're only heating about 80% of a space. Um, so the wattage for this project was 1,973 watts, a total of eight amps, and it was all on one 15 amp, 240 volt non-GFI breaker, which is obviously very important to keep in mind is that you do want these on a non-GFI circuit. Uh, and then the operating cost for these was, the system rather, was about nine cents an hour or 72 cents per day. Right. And the reason why we use 240 instead of 120 isn't because, oh, 240 is so much more efficient than 120. It's so much better. Make sure you get everything done in 240. No, that's not the case. The reason why we use 240 is because the system is over 120 square feet. A thermostat that switches 15 amps, like all of our thermostats do, they switch 15 amps. 15 amps in 120 covers about 120 square feet. So if you have any job that's smaller than 120 square feet, you want to use 120 because it's just as efficient as 240 and it lets you use one breaker space instead of two. Because if you have a house that's old and you're running out of breaker space, you've got one spare and you've got a bathroom that's 50 square foot. Boom, perfect. 120 volt single pole breaker because the system is under 120 square feet. The reason why we use 240 here is because in 240 volts, one thermostat can switch about 240 square feet. So there you go. You have to get a double wide circuit breaker, two spaces, dual pole, but it allows you to purchase just one control instead of two controls. And that breaker is going to be much less expensive than two controls are. So the reason why we did 240 is not because it's any more efficient, which it isn't, is because it lets us heat over 120 square foot on one control. 
That's the reason why. So, and the reason I make such a big deal about that is because it seems like every electrician that we run into says, oh, I, I installed a 240 volt circuit for the floor heat. You don't need a 240 volt square, uh, 240 volt of uh, circuit for a, a bathroom that's 50 square feet. It's, it's a waste of breaker space. Use 120 volt because that is going to be a much more efficient use of your breaker panel than 240. Absolutely. Yeah, I know I have next to no breakers available, so it's always something I'm looking out for. Uh, so when you're looking at testing your system, um, you want to make sure, like we had mentioned earlier, you know, obviously this is going to be going underneath something pretty permanent underneath, you know, a self-leveling concrete, uh, and that you want to make sure that you're able to say, I, di I did everything right, everything was working right when it's installed. Uh, so that's why you want to test your system. We like to say before, during, and after every stage of that install. Installation. Uh, so usually I recommend um, testing it as soon as you receive the product, even if you're not planning on actually doing the install for maybe a few weeks or a month or two. Um, make sure that you take it out of the box, make sure everything's in there, and make sure that you're testing it with your digital ohm meter so that you know, you know, on it's as soon as it's arrived, as soon as it's on your job site, this is going to work. You know, this is not going to be a concern. We don't have to stop our installation because of some problem. Um, and if for whatever reason it isn't working right, if you're getting, you know, readings that are you know incorrect or just seem weird um obviously reach out to us right away and if there is something wonky we're more than happy to obviously you know get that new updated working system out to you right away before you're you know neck deep in this installation yeah, so you want to find that out just like lynn said you want to find that out a week ahead of time as opposed to you know today's the day we've got 15 people here to do this job and oops something's going on here we don't want that to happen yeah, it doesn't tend to happen a lot, but when it does, it's better to not have to deal with all of that stress. Uh, so also you want to make sure that you are utilizing a circuit track. It's a little loudmouth device that we offer that has, um, you know, it's going to just be uh, clipped onto the end of the mat during that entire install or cable. And it's going to let you know if at some point that wire is damaged so that you're able to stop what you're doing, immediately fix it, and then you can move on with the installation so that you don't find out, you know, too late at the end of it once everything's installed that there is a short somewhere. Yeah, so definitely the um, uh, important thing here is to get a, a, a digital ohm meter, not an analog meter with a not with a needle on the front. Uh, that's that's no good. Make sure you get one that's digital. And this meter here was about fifteen dollars at a big box store, and you want to find one that is not not auto ranging. Auto ranging meters are very difficult to work with. You want to get one that has a knob on the front that lets you set it for 200 ohms, 2000 ohms, and 20K because you need to test your sensor also. And your sensor tests in the 20K range and 90% of the heating product we sell tests in the 200 range. So if you get a good reading with the self ranging meter on your floor, odds are that it's going to say that your sensor is not functioning correctly because it's not finding the correct range on its own. You need to set it manually to 20K. So try to find one that's inexpensive. Make sure you find one that lets you set the individual ranges of the ohms. Do not go out and spend a fortune on a self-ranging meter because you're going to end up going out and buying a second one too. They're very, very difficult to use. And if you have one of those old um, analog meters, put it up on your shelf and use it as a display item because that's about all they're good for anymore. So that's that's something that you really want to keep in mind. Now, the circuit check is something that allows you to work over the product, install it while you're so you don't have to sit there with a the meter. It, it's hard to hold the, the wires on the meter and then go lay the product out across the floor. It, you just don't have arms long enough to, to do that. So the circuit check, what it does is after you test it, you put the circuit check on the wires and then you go work on the product and install it across and as you work your way across the room and if it if it yells at you and says you know makes the siren it says whatever you just did you need to stop and take take a take a look there and see what's going on so that's what it's it's kind of like a monitor is all it does it's not a troubleshooting um, tool but it is a monitor to help you know that if you just cleaned your trowel on the floor like i've done multiple times and fortunately i've never hit the wire uh don't i have the worst luck in the world so don't ask me how i missed the wire but when i clear the the trial like that to get it down on the floor i just go i just cannot believe i did that and um fortunately i didn't hit the wire 
So that's what you need to watch out for. So you put the circuit check while you're laying it out, you test it again. Then if it tests good in the middle, that means you can start pouring self-leveling over it. And then once that's done, you can test it again. But you need to take the circuit check off to test it. And when you're done testing it, you have to put it back on. So that's just a little bit of how those two work together on the day of your installation to make sure that it ends up being a good installation. Yeah, absolutely. It's really good, <laughs> really good things to keep in mind. Uh, so this project is a, again, that 10 stone cable on a wood subfloor. It was a bedroom in Kildare, Illinois. So starting out this project, uh, the sketch that we got for this or the sketch that we received and based our smart plan off of um, is obviously like we always like to say, it doesn't need to be pretty, it just needs to be accurate. So just a hand-drawn sketch with the dimensions, uh, the layout of the space. Um, often you want to mark, you know, exactly where you do or specifically don't want heating. Um, and then, you know, you can send that in to us. So this is a really great example of a starting sketch. Yeah, dimensions are very, very important. We never, ever heat under a permanent fixture. Uh, that's not allowed by the National Electric Code. And there's another thing that's not allowed in the National Electric Code that appears on this drawing, and that is the closet. Closet, you're not allowed to heat closets per the National Electric Code. Your local code may be different. And if you're watching from Canada, then you can put electric floor heating in the, in, in the closet as long as you put a control in the closet to control the heat in there. So that's how the US electric, uh, National Electric Code differs from the Canadian code, is Canadian code allows it as long as you use a control. And in the United States, it's not allowed at all in the floor, unless your local code does allow it. And as we say, during these installations, you always follow your local code. It takes precedence over the national code. However, we design to the national code because you know, we don't know what your particular rule is. Once again, there's no way we could keep track of all the different communities and all their different rules. We don't know the answer to that because it changes every day too. So, so that's what's going on. But what we did here is if you take a look at the drawing that we got, it's nothing fancy. You can just take a picture of it and email it to us is we've now done an installation plan and we're showing how the cable is laid out. Notice how we're not going in the closet. But if you take a close look here at the drawing, you can see the dimensions of the room help us figure out how much cable fits into that space. So the cable every three inches across the floor, as long as it's a certain distance from the wall, will cover the whole thing. So if we take a look here along the edge, you can see that number is five and three quarters. That's the distance from the wall over to the strip, the cable fixing strip. And if we look at this side over here, it's the same thing. So let's say that we go, hey, you know what? Don't pay any attention to that plan. Those people got rocks in their heads. Let's put these cable fixing strips a foot inside of the, the space instead of five and three quarter inches. And let's just go ahead and do it. Well, they start stringing it back and forth. And then all of a sudden they get halfway. And what do they look for at halfway mark? Are you asking me? Yes, please. Oh, the red, the red dot. That's for, that's the red dot that would be on the cable. It's white, correct? Correct. Yeah. So that's the halfway mark. So what we do is we tell you the halfway mark on the cable and that way you could compare it to where you are when you're doing your installation. Our, is your white mark here where it's supposed to be? If it is, it tells you you're going to have perfect coverage. If you have put this, the cable fixing strips in a foot on each side, this white mark on your piece of the white piece of tape on your cable is going to end up over here because you're using too little cable. You're too far away from the wall. Well, let's say, ah, you know what? Those people still have rocks in their head. Let's go ahead and put these cable fixing strips right up against the wall. Well, what happens when you do that is now you're using more cable per run each way across. And now that dot, that white mark on your cable is going to end up over here. And you know what that means? That means that you're going to run out of cable over here. So that's why you have to make the marks on your uh, on your floor to make sure that you get the, the, the cable fixing strips at the right place. And that will make the calculation fill the room. Otherwise, you're going to have too little or you're going to have too much. The old saying is it's a little it, it's better to have a little too little than it is to have a little too much because you can never, ever cut the cable.
So that's one thing you have to keep in mind. That's why we go to all this trouble to tell you what the distance is on the sides. We go to the trouble to tell you where the halfway mark is to help you have a successful installation so you don't get stuck with either too little cable or too much cable. Absolutely, yeah. Using the smart plan and following it's going to make that installation job just that much easier. And speaking of the installation, so we're going to show you the actual installation process for this. So again, this Tempzone cable for LVT on a wood subfloor. Uh, the first step, obviously, is preparing your subfloor. You want to make sure, uh, first, you want to make sure that you are checking with the vinyl manufacturer that the vinyl you're looking at using is compatible with the subfloor it's going over. So it's just something to, you know, either look at on the box or the information or talk with them when you are, you know, kind of learn any um, any requirements that they might have. Uh, if you are putting this down on a wood subfloor, you want to make sure that you put a primer down first to help it bond with or help self-leveling concrete bond with the wood surface beneath it. Um, we are going to touch on this a bit more, but keep in mind, uh, self-leveling is incredibly dense. So anything beneath it or in it tends to float up. So you want to make sure that you're going to be securing anything that you put on the subfloor very, very well to the subfloor. Yeah, and you're going to say, wow, that's some luxurious, that, on that picture, that's a luxurious floor. That's not a luxurious floor. It's just plywood covered with primer. And that's the way you want to start. So when you're doing self-leveling, it's going, it's heavy. It's very dense. You know what it's also going to try to do? Gravity is going to try to pull it to earth. And if this is on the second floor, that gravity is going to get, wherever it can find a hole in the floor, it's going to say, come on, self-leveling. And that self-leveling is going to either go into your basement or it's going to go into the kitchen ceiling or wherever that happens to be. So you need to make sure when you're getting ready to do this is that you seal all the holes. So take a look. Here, you can see that piece of white. I made them keep this picture framed like this so you can see that white piece because that white piece is a piece of tape because there was a hole drilled in the center of that floor and we needed to plug that hole first. Then if you look really, really carefully, you can see that there is a bead of caulk all the way around the room and that's keeping the self-leveling from going down the walls. Also, if you have an air vent, if you have an air vent, you want to make a dam around it make a dam around that air vent so the the, the self-leveling just doesn't go whoop right down into your into your vents. That would be extremely bad news. So you need to make sure that that floor, you seal the holes, you make a dam around the vent, and then you put a cork, or not cork, but caulk around the perimeter of the room because that's going to hold it like a bowl because that's what you need, you know, in essence, what you're doing. You're creating a big flat bowl of self-leveling. And it's got to be, it's got to stay there for it to, to, to work. So I cannot tell you the number of times that people that have just decided to skip putting the masking tape every two to three feet. And, you know, we get a call from them going, okay, now my cable's sitting at the top of my, my pour. What do I do now? Pour more. I mean, you have, there's, there's nothing you can do because you're, you're, you're going to have those ridges. So take my word for it. Make sure that you get that attached very, very well. Absolutely. Yeah, we definitely hear about all the all the bad installations that happen. So we definitely know know the handy tips. So looking at laying out the actual temp zone cable, uh, like we had brushed brushed on earlier, um, you want to make sure that you are laying out your fixing strips in accordance to that smart plan that you receive. And then you'll want to attach these to the subfloor. Um, there's, you know, kind of whatever works best for you. Screws, concrete nails, double-sided tape. Um, I think some people do staples. So really whatever you need to do to secure that to the subfloor works fine. From there, you'll start laying out your cable, uh, again, kind of following that pattern, that serpentine pattern, running it back and forth across the floor making sure that at that halfway mark, at that white dot on the red cable, that you are checking the smart plan and ensuring that this is in the correct locations, so that you're going to be getting the coverage that you are planning on having. Um, the smart plan will also indicate the cable spacing. So that's just another thing to, again, keep an eye out for, make sure that you're aware of before walking into that installation so that you are following that smart plan to a T. Yeah, it'll tell you what the dimensions are for that cable, center on center, three inches, four inches, whatever that happens to be. The more cable you have per square foot, the warmer it will be, the hotter it will get. 
So if you start saying, oh, I'm instead of three inches at 15 watts per square foot, I'm going to go to four inches down to 12. Then at five inches, I'm going to go to eight. And, 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 and the numbers are going to vary from that differently, obviously. Also, so you're going from 15 to, let, to, to half. You go from three inch spacing to five inch spacing. You're cutting the wattage per square foot sometimes almost in half. That's a big deal, especially if you're in a basement. Now, if you're on the second floor, you can use a lot of times you can get by with four inch spacing. But the thing also, when you do four of anything beyond four, is now you have a gap between the wires. And you can get what we call striping, where it's warm, cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, because heat only travels about an inch and a half laterally from the cable. That's why most designs are done at three inches, because this cable radiates an inch and a half. And this cable radiates an inch and a half, and that's what gives you the full coverage. If you go four inches, then you're going to have a little tiny sliver in the middle that may not be heating as warm. If you go five inches, now you're going to have a stripe. If you go six inches, now you're going to have a two-inch stripe that's going to be colder. And I'm talking literally like maybe the difference of 85 to 75 to 85. To, it's literally that much difference. So that's what you have to watch out for. You can't just willy-nilly go, hey, I'm going to space it at eight inches instead of three. I'm going to save a whole bunch of money. And then you're going to go cold, warm, cold, warm. So you have to watch out for that. Yeah, you definitely don't want to be walking across cold, warm, cold, warm when you're looking for a warm floor. Exactly. So if you're laying out a flex roll, so our Tempstone flex roll, which we didn't use for this specific installation, um, but it is one of our most popular products. Um, again, you're going to want to follow that smart plan. You will receive a smart plan for a flex roll installation, same as you would with a cable. Um, and basically, you're going to want to lay it out with the cable side down and that mesh facing up. Um, and then you're going to want to cut and turn it in accordance to your smart plan, to your um, to your drawing your layout. Um, so basically to get it going in the other direction, you're going to cut the mesh between the open loops. You never, we've brushed on this before, want to really hammer it home. You never want to cut the cable itself. So you never want to cut that blue cable attached to the mesh. You can just cut the mesh itself and continue unrolling that in the other direction. Uh, so you'll want to then attach this to the subfloor again to prevent it from sink for raising up in the self-leveling to prevent it from you know moving in any way uh, make sure it's attached well to the subfloor using a hot glue gun on that mesh um, or you can also use a staple gun or double-sided tape if you are using a staple gun be very very careful that you are only stapling the mesh itself not the cable um, but you know however works best to secure it to that subfloor usually is perfectly fine yeah, so Lynn was breaking up. Um, uh, she was doing the Max Headroom there for the people that are old enough to know who Max Headroom is. So just a couple of things to reiterate what she said to make sure that we got that out is that you never, ever staple the wire. Never, ever staple over the wire to hold it down. And the, one of the jokes I like to tell is, do you know what likes to float in self-leveling even more than cable? And the answer to that is mesh. So this product is going to try to completely raise up in the pore. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you staple through the mesh into the wood subfloor like every five or six inches at least to hold it down. And what's another great product is hot glue. Hot glue every five or six inches all the way around is going to keep that anchor to the floor to keep it from all raising up because it will float even more so than the, than the cable will. So you really, really have to watch out for that. However, it's easy to, it's easy to staple mesh. So it's not, not that difficult at all. But if you do staple over the wire, you will be calling us for help later because you do not want to do that. Absolutely. So can you tell us a little bit about the floor sensor placement and what to be looking for when you're installing that? The floor sensor, look in the thermostat box. Do not let the flooring professional install the product until you get, don't say, hey, there's the thermostat box. Remind me to open that up when, we are in, when we're done install, installing this product and then I'll wire it to the wall. Uh, no, the, the first thing you need to do is when you see, hey, there's the thermostat box, Open the thermostat box up, take the thermostat out, reach under it, take the sensor out, put the thermostat back in, and then put it away until you're done. But you have to get the sensor installed in the floor. There is no way you can comply with the maximum temperature requirement or limit that the LVT has unless you can measure the temperature of the floor. So 
That's why when you have a product like this, we need to make sure the sensor is installed in the floor. You know, one thing I just thought of that we didn't talk about um, before is a lot of people like to use Nest thermostats or other types of Wi-Fi thermostats. Nest is a great product for tile, but Nest doesn't have a sensor input on it, which means there's no way you can know the temperature of your floor using a Nest thermostat. So if you have a Nest thermostat, odds are you're not going to be able to comply with the warranty requirements of your floor because you have no idea what the temperature of the floor is because the Nest is only measuring the air temperature, not the floor temperature. So your, your LVT could be sitting there going at 100 degrees. We don't know, but you'll never know because there's no way to know. That's why you need to use one of our thermostats with the floor sensor, and you need to remember to put it in because that way you're going to be able to set it for 84 and comply with your warranty requirements. Another thing is another common mistake that people go, all right, well, I've got this thermostat here. I'm going to run the sensor all the way out into the middle of the room. Well, you don't need to do that either. All you need to do is get the sensor down, the sensor um, uh, wire down the wall, make sure that it's not in the same conduit as the heating, the non-heating leads. They can never go in the same conduit as the leads. So make sure that that, that sensor wire goes down the wall, goes across and into the closest wire the closest area between two of the wires about uh, what, six to eight inches in. It doesn't need to roll to the other side of the floor. Just get it to the area closest to the thermostat, go through an open loop. Here you can see that there is a blue wire. That blue wire, that's a closed loop. You would not want to run the sensor wire over this. You want to run this, the sensor wire in the open loop halfway between the heating wires, just as it's shown there. Because remember, the heat travels an inch and a half laterally, and it's right there in the sweet spot. It's not going to be too hot, and it's not going to be too cold. It's going to be right where you want it to be. So that's what you need to remember. And if you buy a backup sensor, more power to you. If you install it, more power to you. You want to put it in an open loop and run it across the floor, up the wall, but do not connect it to the thermostat. Because if you have two sensors connected to the same thermostat, your floor will never heat because the ohms readings from the sensor that it's looking for are going to be wrong. And your thermostat will say 180 degrees or 150 degrees. Well, we know it's not 150 degrees. We, the place would be on fire if it were. But that means as soon as someone says my thermostat says 150, it means that two of the sensors are wired and only one of them should be wired. So take the other one and coil it up and put it in the back of the in the back of the thermostat box, but don't attach it. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely a question we get a lot. So good tips. So looking at the self-leveling concrete um, application. So uh, touching on, you know, kind of what we talked about earlier, make sure that you're testing your system before laying out the self-leveling. Obviously concrete or cement tends to be uh, pretty permanent. So you wanna make sure that you are putting it over a working system. So use that ohm meter, make sure that everything is working properly. And then you can begin laying out your self-leveling. Um, you'll want at least 3 eighths of an inch um, some manufacturers of LVT request a half inch in between the um, the heating element and the floor itself. Uh, so as long as it's three eighths or more of an inch, then you are perfectly fine uh, to do so. Um, make sure that the flex roll or the cable um, are all again secured very very well using masking tape or however you're planning to secure it, and then you can begin laying out your self leveling. So. Um... Lynn, I think, might have been breaking up a little bit there. It's either her or me, so if it's me, I apologize. But um, one thing we need to talk about also is the depth of the wire. Because in a really old house, if you use self-leveling in an old house, if you attach the wire to the, to the subfloor, and the subfloor in the middle of the room is this, um, this much lower than along the edges, because it has sunk over time, if your floor has a, um, a, a hollow spot or a deep spot where it sinks, then you need to self-level it first and get it flat. Then put the cable on and cover it with, again, another layer of self-leveling. Because we didn't talk about this, but it's important, and, and we want to make sure the further the wire gets away from the surface of the floor, the cooler it will be. So if you have a room that's cold in the center and it's hot on the edges, 
that tells me you as soon as you say that it tells me you probably have an old house you put the cable directly on the subfloor and the subfloor in the center is two inches lower than the floor is along the edge of the room so always look out for that very very important to keep an eye on that because you get too deep that area will feel cooler than the other parts and also another reason there we go back to self leveling not thin set you cannot substitute thin set for the self leveling yes absolutely so from here you'll begin installing your lvt can you tell us a little bit about how you'll be doing that exactly as the instructions tell you um, <laughs> um, because they're going to tell you um, you're want, you're going to want to make sure that the self leveling has gotten to the correct dryness requirement. So you're going to take your little probes and put it in the self leveling to make sure it's dry enough to install the um, the um, LVT over. So you want to make sure that 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 you follow that requirement. Um, do not power up the system to test it. Only way you test the system is with a digital ohm meter. So don't power it up until the SLC, self-leveling so concrete, cures. That could be three days, it could be eight hours. It'll tell you on the bag what the cure, cure date is or how long it takes to cure. Do not turn the heat on until it's cured. Cured does not mean hard enough to walk on. Two different things. Hard enough to walk on is not cured. So make sure you follow the instructions on the self-leveling bag that'll tell you, allow to cure for this amount of time. That's the amount of, amount of time you want to wait until you put the heat on and you don't install the LVT over the top until it's dry enough. Awesome. So when you are done with all that, your flooring is down and you're, um, you know, you have your thermostat ready to go. Um, you want to make sure that you are, we kind of touched on this briefly as well, um, looking at and setting your temperature limit for your flooring system. So again, making sure that you're checking with the manufacturer um, for any kind of uh, temperature limit. Um, our, we have a few different uh, preset settings on our thermostats. Um, one is our laminate setting. So that's going to max the temperature out at 82 degrees. Um, that tends to be very common, a very common temperature limit. Um, um, for both laminate and vinyl. Um, so often you'll just end up setting it to the laminate setting and you're good to go. Um, or you can set a custom maximum temperature if it's not 82 degrees, if there's something different that you're trying to, you know, make the maximum temperature. Uh, this is using or utilizing that floor heating thermostat or that floor heating sensor rather uh, that is in the floor already. And that's why we talked about it, you know, at length, you want to make sure that you are putting that floor sensor in uh, during that installation that you have it in before you lay out any kind of self leveling so that it can really give you an exact temperature reading to the exact degrees so that you know, um, you know, that you are not going to be damaging your system or your flooring at any point. Yeah, so if, you're, if your manufacturer requires 81 degrees, you need to go to custom and choose that and choose 81. So um, it's very, very important that we follow those directions. Now, one thing that we always get requests for, and Lynn can tell you this, because she talks to a lot more customers in the buying mode than I do, um, is that a lot of people want to heat three seasons three season rooms or four season rooms. Uh, these type of rooms are usually rooms that are built onto the house on a concrete slab with a row of windows, a row of windows and a row of windows. All those windows and a concrete slab and poorly insulated means that that area has a lot of heat loss usually. The more windows you have, the more heat loss you, has, you have, the more difficult it is to heat that space. So, Taking, I like to bring it up right here because if you take a look at the thermostat over there, then you will see that there is laminate maximum temperature of laminate. The maximum that floor will ever get is 82. So if you look at laminate max 82 and then you look at tile max 104, what, what flooring type do you think would put more heat in the room? Well, the answer to that is the more heat goes into the room, as a result of the higher temperature available in the floor. So laminate and LVT are what we call a throttled application. So it's like a throttle body in a NASCAR race. It's only allowed to go so fast. You can't go any faster. With this, it's you can only go to a certain temperature. And this is the maximum temperature you can go to. However, if you choose tile, you can get it this hot. Well, which product do you think is better to heat a poorly insulated space? Do you think it's the laminate? 
here or do you think it's tile here? And the answer is tile because you can get more BTUs out of tile because it gets warmer than the product that's throttled at 82. So I don't like to just say, hey, we don't suggest laminate or, or, or LVT for three season rooms. It's better to know why, because then that, that lets you go in with an intelligent, well, here's why they say not to, because it's a limited throttled application. So if we need to make sure we get a lot of heat into that room, please use tile as an alternative. It may not be, it may not be exactly what you want, but you can get more heat out of it than you can laminate or LVT. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a good point. Sometimes, even though the tile may feel colder, you can definitely make it a lot warmer. So looking at the actual wiring process, um, we always, always recommend following code. So obviously following any, any uh, national electric code, as well as checking and following all local electrical and building codes. Uh, you want to make sure that you are, um, you know, kind of aware of those and that you are complying with anything like that. Um, there we go, the NEC. There's our, there's our book. <laughs> and it's a fun, fun read, isn't it? Yeah, oh, it's fantastic. Uh, so again, you a lot of local codes are going to uh, require that this wiring is done by a licensed electrician. I mean, I personally always recommend it as well. If you're not a licensed electrician, usually it's better to hand that off to the pros and let someone else do that wiring, um, especially because it isn't an especially difficult wiring job. It usually doesn't take, you know, a licensed pro a lot longer than, you know, maybe what, what would you say, Scott, an hour to do all the wiring? He, well, when it comes to pulling the circuit and that sort of stuff, that's a whole other thing. Well, sure. But but simply running the wire up to the box and, and turning and doing that, yeah, that's an hour of labor. They're going to charge you six hours to get there and back, but they're, that's how they're going to make their money. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. Is there anything else you want to touch on with wiring, Scott? I know you've worked a little bit more extensively with that. Um, some states require that an electrician actually lay the product down on the floor, too. So, don't be surprised if your code official, your authority having jurisdiction says, you need to have an electrician lay that out on the floor. That's like sometimes in Minnesota, sometimes in the state of Washington, it all depends on what the local code is. But most of the code that we go by allow any DIY person to lay the product out on the floor. And some of them don't require an electrician to hook it up, but we strongly suggest you get a licensed and bonded electrician to hook the system up to the circuit. So yes, that that's about it. That's what you want. That's what you want to watch out for. And to to recap, because people ask us this every day, can I put the floor sensor wire in the same conduit as the non-heating leads? And the answer to that is no. That's why you need to look at this drawing here. Please take a look at that. You see that there are two conduits going to the floor: one for the sensor and one for the non-heating leads. Now, some local code doesn't require a low voltage sensor wire to go in conduit. In Chicago, it, it, they do require that because the city burned down once. So they're really, really particular about their electric code. I would be too if my city burned to the ground. Um, but some other cities with low voltage cable, it's not that big of a deal. Just run it down the open wall, the open gap in the wall, and just run it out to the floor and get it into the sensor. Never run them for long distances right next to each other because induction from the high voltage lead will blow out the readings from the sensor it'll never act correct awesome so and touching kind of briefly on our different thermostat options um, we do have a few different options kind of based on um, or you can pick them based on how you plan to use the system so we have um, an in our entrust as a non-programmable thermostat it's going to really give you um, you know basically just on and off functionality as well as kind of changing the temperature um, and then we have our most popular models is our inspire touch or our inspire touch wi-fi it's definitely the one that we would recommend going with the most. Um, it's going to be incredibly user friendly. It uh, has seven day programming, uh, it's a touch screen. It's really, really simple to use and to set up, um, you know, any kinds of temperature limits or things like that. So generally for an LVT application, I personally recommend going with the Inspire Touch, but obviously, you know, Scott, you maybe a little touch on that. 
unless one thing, and that is that if the LVT company does not allow you to do a setback temperature. Yes. Because if they say you have to keep it at 82 or you have to keep it at 84, what, what's really interesting in the flooring business is the most expensive floors require the least expensive thermostat. Because the least expensive thermostat is the entrust, and you set it to a temperature and you leave it there forever until the end of the season. Then if your LVT manufacturer says you can do a deviation of three degrees per day, okay, that's fine. At the end of the season, I go from 82 to 79. Then the next day I go from 79 to 76. Then the next day I go 76 to 73 until eventually I can turn it off. You do that the same thing at the beginning of the season. So if you start at 68, you go up three degrees. Then the next day you go up three more. Then the next day three more until you get up to and ramp up to that temperature. And then it stays there forever. This is the unit you want for that. If you are not allowed to do a setback, get the entrust because it's the least expensive and it will it's a set it and forget it. And it's perfect for that. If you're allowed to do a setback, then the Wi-Fi um, is a great one. The regular touch is a great one too. And they're available in a bunch of groovy different colors too. Absolutely. Yeah, there definitely are some cool ones. So this is the finished project. Uh, so you can see the floor is beautiful. It's all even. There's nothing, no bumps or ridges or anything. And it turned out just really, really well. Yeah, the LBT looks almost as stunning as that primered plywood did before we even got started. All right, so touching on the project cost. Uh, so for the the cable was uh, $800 for that 595 uh, linear feet of cable. Uh, they use an Inspire Touch Wi-Fi thermostat so they can control it through their phone and that's 295. And then the circuit check and fixing strips rounds it out to about $1,121 for that whole project. Yeah, it's it's today the twenty first of November. That'd be that'd be perfect, wouldn't it? The, it's oh. eleven. It's eleven twelve on eleven eleven here. Happy Veterans Day <laughs> to all the veterans in the crowd. We uh, thank you for serving. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's um. You can see this is this is why we make such a big deal about it because we want you to get good results. The thing is, if we just sell you a product, and go here you go, uh, that you put the vinyl down and you and it cups and it gets damaged or whatever because it's not warranted to be used over electric radiant heat we haven't done our job our job is to make sure our customers know what's going on um, ahead of time know how to make an informed decision and get the best type of installation for the most successful most enjoyable installation that's why we do these right is because we want to make sure that everybody goes i just watched something that was informative that showed me i need to check for these things i saved myself so much time and that's what we're here for that's why we are here today to do that Absolutely. Are there any questions on that? You know, anything that we have gone over, any, you know, anything that we could answer for you to make your potential heating project that much easier? Because obviously that is what we strive to do. And well, obviously, let's give, them, let's, you know, let's give them a second to think, shall we? Let's go to some questions that people, were you thinking the same thing? I was. I love, the, I love the way you think, because we should probably talk about the questions that were submitted to us ahead of time. Yes. And that will give the people watching now a chance to, to think, Hey, I, that jogs my memory or that, that makes me want to answer this, ask this question. So, um, the first question we had was from Chris and he's, uh, he or she may have said that requirements for testing. Well, I think we covered that pretty well. Don't you Lynn? I do. Okay. So test it before, during, and after with a digital ohm meter and get a circuit check for the times where you can't be testing it. Um, the next question we had is, can this product be installed in a motor home? Uh, you know, can you kind of touch on that, Scott? Well, the thing is with motor homes, when you're driving a motor home, um, they tend to flex. There's flex in the chassis. And flex in a chassis is not really a good combination with a layer of self-leveling because self-leveling can kind of... Uh, fall apart under duress if the if the the floor flexes like this you have to have a nice flat floor to do that so the best application we've seen is environ with laminate that's the best product to use because you're not using self-leveling in this thing that flexes all the time 
So the best bet for uh, motorhomes is our Environ product with a floating laminate application. Great, great question. That Thank is a good you, question. Elma. Mm -hmm. Mike asks, is this a good product to offer to customers who have three seasons room that has no HVAC? Uh, we talked about that, didn't we? If so, yeah. what is an average cost per day to run this through the winter system to keep it 60 degrees? That requires an HLC. Would you let them know what an HLC is, Lynn? You yes. just worked on one of these yesterday, didn't you? I have been working on quite a few recently. So HLC is a heat loss calculation. Uh, it's a report that we offer that we can uh, do some calculations for you. You'll give us information on the space, um, mainly things like the size of the room, um, the type and amount of insulation in that space, space, as well as, you know, anything like exterior facing walls, windows, doors, um, anything that can kind of tell us, you know, how much heat is lost in this room, um, you know, throughout a day or throughout an average day throughout the entirety of the year. Um, and that's going to, um, you know, from there we can answer, will this be enough to heat that space up to, like I think Mike had said, about 60, 65 degrees, something like that. Uh, so you'll be able to actually see, we'll be able to tell you, um, uh, more or less with some certainty that this is, yes, this is going to be able to heat that space or no, you would want something else. This would just be a, a supplementary heating source. Um, and then kind of talking about it, um, you know, being or taking over for a, an HVAC system or, you know, in a room that doesn't have one. Um, obviously, this can do uh, some really cool, great things with heating. Uh, it's not going to help at all with any AC. So if you're looking at getting, you know, this as your heating and maybe putting in a window air conditioner or something in a three season room, that might be a really good option. So lots of great information there, Lynn. Here are the main um, BTU bandits, I like to call them. BTU bandits are things that steal heat out of a room. Heat loss. That means heat is escaping somehow. Enemies of BTUs are windows. Lots of windows. The bigger the window, the poorly, the older the window, the more it's going to let heat out. Um, you know what looks really cool above your head? Those things that are over your head, what are those called? Those are called um, skylights. Uh, skylights. Another another terrible thing for heat loss um i love fireplaces as much as the next person but when that flu doesn't seal all the way that is a heat loss um, burglar it's stealing it's stealing a btu burglar stealing all the btus out of that room exterior exterior doors as soon as you open that door what happens all the heat goes outside the more exterior walls the more heat loss you're going to have so if you're in a bathroom that all the walls are inside, none of them face an outdoor, there's going to be hardly any heat loss in that room. But it's, but you get this gigantic room, this gigantic bathroom with 18-foot ceilings. 18-foot ceilings are BTU bandits. They are stealing. Now, all you do is you add some skylights in there, too, and three walls of windows, and that room is very difficult to heat. And I've seen a few of those where people call and go, I bought my floor heat. It's not warm in this room. And I walk into the room, three walls, 18 feet high, full of windows and three exterior walls. It's just, that's the nature of that business. So that's a great, great question. Thank you for asking that, Mike. And what other thing did we learn about three season rooms? Um, what would probably be a little bit better choice than LVT? Tile. Yes. Um, Next question is from Chris, and Chris says, do I need a 120 volt circuit? Can the heating element run off of 12 volts DC? And the answer to that is it cannot run on 12 volts DC. It needs to run on 120 volts, or if your installation is over 120 square feet, you'll need a 240 volt dual pole breaker and a circuit for that product. So you can use one thermostat. The next question is from Paul. Paul asks, is, is the warm floor capable or compatible with the glue down vinyl? So um, let's take a look at this picture real quick. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hammer on this too much, but take a look at this picture. The sun comes in, the sun is going to make this floor hotter than our system ever will. If this floor is hit directly with sunshine, our system is late is limited to 82 or 81 or whatever that temperature is right that's not even warm enough to that's like putting your hand on it even less 
your hand is not going to melt any glue unless you bought it from someone that we don't know where you bought it from. But the heat from sunshine hitting your floor is going to be much higher than the temperature that we're going to provide in that floor. So the moral of that story is that you don't have to worry about the glue um, causing or having any problems because of the heat. Yes, absolutely. It's not, it's a non-issue at that point. You can just put it right on the self-leveling. Right. What's Chris, do, uh, are you able to see the questions there too, Lynn? Do you see the question from Cheryl? Number uh, six there, do you see her question? Here. Yes, Cheryl says, Cheryl said she is interested in learning about the LVT installation so she can spec it for clients and um, know what she's talking about with installers. So more or less the last hour. Yeah, <laughs> I hope yeah. we've given her some good information. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, number seven, go ahead and what is that one? Uh, Chip wants to know, is there a particular brand of LVT not recommended over floor heating? the brand that says not to do so in their installation manual. That's, That's how you answer. know. That's how you know. You, you, if you're on the, if you're internet savvy, you go to their website, you open their installation manual, if you can find it, and then you do a control F and you do a search for radiant. And when you have that screen and do control F for find, you put in the word radiant and then look and see if there's radiant mentions there. It'll either say yay or nay usually. So that's how you know, that's the way to do it. Absolutely. And our last question is from John, who wants to know, can your systems replace traditional heating systems for homes such as HVAC? And just like Lynn said earlier, we can do the HV, but not the AC. Yes. So what's the first thing, because Lynn, you've been doing this a lot the last couple of days. What, what do you, um, how do you get a customer, what process happens when somebody says, hey, I'm interested in heating this room? Will it work as a sole source of heat? And, and what's, what's your response? The response is always going to be, I don't know, let's find out. It's usually more often than not, I, I see it being perfectly fine as a primary heating source. Um, however, we don't want to guarantee that because there are, like you had mentioned earlier, so many different variables in, you know, will this be able to heat your space fully? Um, so that's why you always want to, if you're wondering that, if you're working on a project where this, you might want this to be the sole source of heat, or you want to know, you know, will this keep the space comfortable? You know, let's get a heat loss calculation going for you. Let's give you an actual, you know, mathematical answer so that you're not going into it blind. You can actually know for sure, will this be enough to heat my space comfortably? Yeah, I mean, if somebody asks me, hey, will this be enough? And I go, well, it might be, but I'm never going to say yay or nay without a heat loss calculation done because as soon as they go, oh yeah, that'll be fine. Then next winter they call up and go, it's really cold in this room. You told me it'd be fine and it isn't. That's why we don't do that because it just, there's so many different variables in buildings. You know, we don't know if that three season room has R12 in the wall or if it has R1 in the wall, you know, so th there's no way we can say um, the answer to that. You know, it is what it is. Yeah, absolutely. And that's all the questions I see on here. Yeah, and I don't see any other questions here. So let's just go ahead and uh, get back to where we were and um, talk about this. Yeah, so um, next, I believe it's next month we're going to be sending out, we're not going to be doing a webinar because it will be the holidays. And I don't think any of us want anything else on our plate. Uh, so we'll be sending out an email featuring our best webinars of 2021. So you can actually look back at the last year and have them all in one place, all of that really handy dandy information, um, you know, kind of at your fingertips. And there's a lot, a lot of information in there for you. Um, also, if you like this kind of format, if you like, you know, kind of doing these daily or these trainings, uh, we do offer daily training sessions right here on Crowdcast. Um, generally, we offer them at least once a day, if not twice a day. They're hosted by a lot of them are hosted by me. Some are hosted by Scott or our other technicians. Uh, so it's a really great place to pop in, spend five, 10 minutes learning about some of our products and also getting any questions that you might have answered. Our monthly promotion is um, off of our Environ Easy Mats. These are pre-sized Environ Mats, again, for under laminate, under floating wood. If you're in the US, it can go under carpet, and these are gonna be 20% off. So visit our website for more information on that monthly promo. 
And can you uh, tell them a little bit about um, how much we love to hear compliments and nice things and also, you know, any kind of normal feedback? Well, I'm not used to getting compliments, so I'm gonna, just going to leave that there. But um, we would much rather discuss topics in these things that interest you as opposed to think, okay, well, we should talk about this. We'd much rather talk about something that you say, hey, what about this or what about that? If you have one of those questions, let us know and we can do something about it. We'd much rather do something that's interesting to you than for us just to go, okay, uh, let's talk about that. Um, so that's what we're looking for. So please let us know and uh, we'll be glad to help out as any way we can. Absolutely. And if you have questions, if you need any assistance or want quotes or heat loss calculations or anything, please reach out to us. Um, you can give us a call. You can shoot us an email. Um, you can visit our website or our socials, our Facebook, anything like that is going to have um, just a ton of information on our products, um, on installation. I know our website has some really great blog posts and videos. Uh, so there is a treasure trove of information out there and if that doesn't answer your question or if you need assistance like i said we are obviously always here for you yeah we have a video that shows this exact installation a video version i did um, with a couple of other people on this one and um, so check that out because it's uh it gives you an idea from start to beginning what happens during the install yeah Awesome. So that is all that we have today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know I had a great time always talking about LVT. Uh, so again, for Warmly Yours, I am Lynn. I'm joined by... Scott, thanks for watching. And until next time, as always, stay warm. And be radiant. Bye, everybody. <laughs>